You guys doing good? This new year's begun, 2024. I don't know where I'm at personally. Um, <laughs> this is like my first week back in real life and I'm uh, really behind. I'm like, what day is it again? Where am I supposed to be? Um, it's a struggle, but it's fine. So bear with me if I'm a little bit confused up here. Hopefully I get it together, but I'm excited just to kick the year off and talk to you guys and just kind of set the pace for the year, at least for me. So if nothing else, I get something out of it, right? But so we're talking about knockout blows this month, and it's just basically talking about, like, let's, let's set ourselves up for a successful year. Let's, let's, let's land the punches on the enemy instead of him landing some punches on us. Does that sound good to you guys? Yeah? So it's a near you, near, new year, and people are always like, like that's the typical thing, right? New year, new you. Right, anybody, you start your diet or whatever. I know some of y'all are doing like 10 days no sugar, like legit no sugar. Like not just like, I'm not going to eat pumpkin pie anymore or drink hot chocolate, but like literally no sugar, no bread, no cheese. I don't think no cheese, right? No cheese, yeah, right there. I know you're doing it, no cheese. It's, I I think it's just Daniel fast basically. Sorry, not to pick you out, Amelia. (laughs) I know you're one of them, but, um, you know, we do all these things in this new year, and we feel like we have a fresh start. I'm going to really be different this year, really going to be different. I told myself last night when I went to sleep, you're going to be better tomorrow. You are going to get up. You're going to get out of bed, and you're going to get on the day. Did I get up? No. No, I did not. I, I laid in bed. It was like 8.30 when I finally got out of bed, and I was like, this is not what I told myself last night. <laughs> It's a different year, but the truth is you're not going to change unless you want to and unless you actually get a plan to change, all right? But the good news is that you can change. Change can happen whenever and wherever when you finally make that, uh, de- that decision. So knockout blows. What is a knockout blow? Does anybody know? Any, any boxing fans in the room? My dad, I grew up watching boxing wrestling, the wolf pack. Um, I watched, what's the one guy? I can't think of his name right now. Like blonde hair, always wears red. He's like, so yeah, Hulk Hogan. I grew up watching all that stuff. My mom was like, why is your daughter in the room? And I just wanted to be with my dad. So I just sat there and watched it. It was probably not the most edifying thing for my life, but you can see like these dudes like take some serious hits, right? Like it is rough. You, especially boxing, like the wrestling stuff was more fake, but boxing like is an intense sport. That's so intense. And so you'll see these opponents going at each other and there's like fights. There's even some fights that are happening in the next month. But like they're fighting not just like to land a punch on the other person, but to like stay alive, like literally like to defend themselves. And so a knockout blow is an event or action that causes someone or something to fail and potentially causes death. Boxers have actually died from receiving a knockout punch to the head. Like if it lays them out, there's a possibility they're not waking up from that. So we don't want that in our life. You are not a boxer, but you do live in a world that delivers, tries to deliver blows, and you do have an enemy that's trying to land a punch on you. And 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You see, just like two opponents in a boxing ring, they're not just like coming out and like wailing on somebody, right? There's a little bit of like, there's a little bit of planning. There's a little bit of strategy in this. Like I'm gonna be patient. I'm gonna wear you down and I'm gonna wait for that moment when you just barely lower your defenses to see if I can get a hit on you. It's not like Satan is out there like just doing all kinds of random things. He's calculated. He's looking at what can he do to trip you up. And the the truth is, it's the little punches. Not the big ones. It's the little punches that eventually add up to that knockout punch if it keeps happening. And Satan runs that game. He likes to wear you down. Now, I want to lay this out. I know I'm starting talking about Satan. And the truth is, we don't need to talk about Satan, right? He's a defeated foe. He's an absolute zero. He's a nothing. But the Bible says to be alert. So we're going to talk about being alert, So I don't want anyone to leave here thinking that Satan can can beat you, that Satan can hurt you, that Satan um, is this all-powerful, mighty person who rules the world. He doesn't. It's over for him. But he can try to wear you down. He can try to get you in a place where you take yourself out, ultimately. And I'm going to say something that's really controversial. Are you ready? It's controversial. Jesus delivered you from everything but three things. 
what did she just say? But it's true, right? Okay, so Jesus delivered you from sin. He, he made it so you could be free. You can go to heaven, but he did not deliver you from persecution. Jesus says it. You're gonna be persecuted. If they hated me, they gonna hate you. So he didn't deliver you from that. He didn't deliver you from submission, which basically means I have to obey. I have to willingly submit myself to the authorities that he placed in my life and to him. Like, that's the only way it goes. It is not in the sense of control, but in the sense of he knows what's best for you. Like, it literally is his way or no way, right? Like, this is how we live our life. And he didn't deliver you from temptation. Now, that needs to be separated a little bit. He delivered you from sin. It has no power over you, but the enemy still has the right to tempt you. That's why the Bible talks about be alert, be steady, that you don't fall into temptation. So those are three things and three places that the enemy will come into your life and try to wear you down. Can I wear you down? Can I, can I get enough people riled up against you that it's gonna make you step back, that you're not gonna talk about God anymore, that you're not gonna talk about Jesus anymore? Can we wear you down? Can, can, I, can I get you a little prideful and puff you up a little bit so you won't submit to the voices in your life that are pointing you in the right direction? Can I, can I put enough temptations in your path and keep layering them and layering them? Have you guys ever seen, I think I talked about this last time I spoke, I don't remember, but the video of like the little kids that they put in a room and they put marshmallows on the table and they tell the little kids, don't eat the marshmallow until I get back and if you wait, I'll give you two. Well, eventually, over time, like you're just looking at this marshmallow or whatever it is for you. For me, it'd probably be like pumpkin pie or some sort of candy. But anyways, like, and and the longer you look at it, the longer you're in the vicinity of it, the more you're like, wow, I really want that. I want that. It looks good. It tastes good. Like my desire for it is increasing, right? And so if he can get you places that you shouldn't be, and if he can get you to meditate on things you shouldn't meditate on, that temptation is it's going to begin to wear you down. And so these are the areas that Satan comes to try if he can land a few little punches on you so he can get the knockout punch, right? So that's kind of how it works. And once again, he's a defeated foe. So you already have the victory, but we have to talk about the ways that he tries to wear you down so you can continue to walk in that victory. And the thing is, to defend yourself from this knockout blow is pretty simple, really. It's not a complicated thing. We just make it complicated over time. But Ephesians, in chapter six, it says this, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the enemy. And there's a whole chapter you should read. Honestly, it's an amazing chapter, and you have to take some time. It's not like one of those things that you're gonna get in your plan tomorrow that you're just gonna read through and walk away from and know what it's talking about. Like, you need to take some time and understand what are these pieces of armor that I'm supposed to be putting on. But I'm just gonna breeze through them kind of quickly here. The first piece of armor is the belt of truth. And in fact, it is, the Bible says, what every other piece of armor sits on. And so what is the belt of truth? Well, what is truth? It's kind of simple, right? Right? It's, it's God's word. It's what God says about something. What does God say about you? What does God say about the decisions that you're making? What does God say about the friends that you have? What does God say about the dreams that you have, the situations you're in? What does he say about your life? And when you build on what God says, now that's putting you into his kingdom, it's putting you in a place where you're not going to be worn down, where you're less likely to have temptation when you build your life on that foundation. So many people, and not just young people, like we like to pick on young people when it comes to identity. Like we like to be like, well, young people, they just need to hear about identity, they just don't know who they are. But the truth is, most humans don't know. Most adults that I work with that are like, hey, Pastor Alicia, I need help. And I'm not that, I'm always like, I don't know what you think you're gonna get from me. I mean, I'm just gonna take you back to the word. So, I mean, if you wanna talk it through, it's fine. (laughs) But most people, it comes down to they don't know who they are. They have absolutely no truth in their life as far as their identity is concerned. None whatsoever, and they go through life believing all of these lies. And the thing is, the reason we talk to you so much about it is because those lies happen actually even younger than you are. They begin when you're, sometimes even in the womb. Like I have prayed with people and they start talking about things and, and, and recounting things that they weren't even like actually like in this, phys- like right here for, like it was things that their parents thought or believed or spoke over them when they were pregnant. Like 
those identity things, the enemy starts to like toss those in as early as he possibly can. And so getting to you when you're young and talking about this and telling you what the truth is, getting that belt of truth on you as soon as possible is gonna help you so much. And so you gotta go back to the word. What does God say about anything and everything? If you didn't ask him about it, you need to stop what you're doing and go back and ask him, fill in the blank, whatever that is. Go back and find out what his word says. And then the next piece of armor we've got is the breastplate of righteousness. And righteousness is a scary word. Like, it's really big, and it feels really vague, and like, what does this mean? But basically, righteousness means right standing. Righteousness is the quality or state of being morally correct or justifiable, and those are also big words. (laughs) It can be considered synonymous or similar to rightness or being upright. And so righteousness is just this big word, and all it means is right, like I'm in right, I'm in a right place, I'm doing the right thing, all these things. And we get kind of uptight about some of that, right? Like I don't know about you, but me, I'm very concerned most days, and I've had to really lay this with Jesus, like am I doing the right thing, am I doing the right thing, am I doing the right thing, did I say the right thing? Not for the sake, for me it's not a people pleasing thing, but um, I, I don't wanna lead anyone wrong. Like, I'm like, you know, don't ask me. Like, I don't want to lead you wrong. Like, go ask Jesus or go ask Pastor Gary. Like, please. Like, I don't want to point you the wrong direction. I only want to point you to Jesus. And as long as I keep that first, I'm going to be okay. So that's what I'm working on this year. And that's what I'm learning. But anyways, like that, that place of just knowing that, that you're okay and that you're loved and accepted and you're worthy. That's what that righteousness is. And It's a breastplate, why? Because it protects all my organs, right? So if you were wearing a breastplate, it would cover this whole area. So everything is is essential to me functioning is protected by that rightness. And what's really cool is that Jesus gave you his righteousness. So you don't have to be right on your own. And we get tripped up on that, I get tripped up on that. And I have to remind myself, no, Jesus gave me his righteousness. So it doesn't matter what I do He made me right. So there's nothing that I can do to make myself more right. Like I want everyone to think for just a second, close your eyes for a second. I want you to imagine that for the rest of your life, you just sat on your bed and did nothing. And you were just you. You are just, you can even just say to yourself, you can just say your name, I'm just Alicia. Now I want you to understand that that image you have of yourself right now, most people would be like, There's a preconception, right, that other people have. So it might be as you're sitting there that you're thinking lazy, stupid, dumb, whatever. But Jesus wipes all that away and you could continue to sit like that and he would love you. Like you can't do anything more for him to love you or to care about you. You can open your eyes. I'm just trying to keep you undistracted. There is nothing you can do to change that. Does that make sense? Like if you can just process that for a little bit, there is nothing I can do more to earn his love, to be more righteous, to be more worthy of what he's given me. There's nothing I could do wrong that would decrease that either. Like it is set. He loves me. He cares for me and he gave me his righteousness, which means that I am righteous. Second Corinthians 5, 21 says, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So because of Jesus, you're already righteous and you just have to wear it. The difference is that the reason why it's a part of the armor of God is because you have to decide, I believe this, I'm gonna put it on. I'm going to put on the righteousness of Jesus. It doesn't mean that I don't make mistakes or that I'm a perfect human, but it means that he loves me and that's where I start. So then the next thing is the shoes of the gospel of peace. And this one's tricky. A lot of people kind of disagree on which, what this means, but my study has led me to believe that, first of all, what are shoes for? They're for protecting your feet. But they're also for walking, right? Like you don't, unless you're my kids, just go out randomly without shoes on. You normally put shoes on and you're walking. And so wherever you go, you are taking this kingdom with you. When you put on those shoes, it's like, I know the truth and the goodness of God and that his, his gospel and his message and what he came for is peace. I'm going to take it with me. And everywhere I go, I take peace. Everywhere I go, I take his kingdom. But I think also shoes provide traction. 
right? Like if you're a boxer in a ring, I mean, sometimes they do it barefoot, but a lot of times they've got shoes on. If you're an athlete of any kind, you normally wear shoes. Why? To protect your feet and for traction. And so the Bible talks about a lot in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. It says, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless, but unmov- immovable, right? Those shoes of the gospel of peace allow you to stand strong, to stand firm, to look the enemy in the eyes and say, no, you've already lost, I've already won, and you can't take my friends, you can't take my family, you can't touch me and you can't touch them. That, the, that understanding of the gospel, of God's goodness, of the peace that comes with understanding that goodness, it allows you to put two feet down and not move, and not move off of the word. Then we've got the shield of faith. And the shield of faith is pretty simple. You all know what a shield is, right? You hold it up. Normally you got a sword or a weapon of some sort in this hand. You got a shield in this hand. And the shield is, is basically that understanding that God is good and that he, what he says is true. What he says is right and what he says he'll do. Because that alone, just understanding what God says is true and that he will always be faithful to fulfill it and that he's good, ultimately good, that quenches a lot of lies of the enemy immediately. That shield of faith, that belief that he is good and he wants good for me, it protects all the rest of the armor and it it makes it very difficult for the enemy to get through it. And so you hold that up, you know, and that's, that's actually not really easy in this world. There's a lot of things to, that you could worry about There's a lot of opinions out there that could confuse your mind and make you unsure of what's true, unsure of whether God really is who he says he is. I, you know, we we got to interview Mr. Pat earlier and some of you have heard his story, but there's a lot of people that walk around in this world really believing that God doesn't exist or if he does, he's a horrible person, just a horrible person. And the enemy loves that thought process because if you believe God is either non-existent or that he is bad and does bad things, it separates you immediately from your answer. It separates you immediately from the thing that can make your life transformed, that can take you where you need to go. And then we've got the helmet of salvation. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says this, but we understand these things for we have the mind of Christ. The helmet of salvation is pretty simple. Once I put that on, first of all, I'm a new creature. When I get saved, I am no longer the person I was yesterday. I'm new. And with that new creature comes a new thought process. It comes uh, with a new perspective of the world. So when I have that helmet on, I have the mind of Christ, meaning I don't struggle with anxiety, meaning that I don't struggle with those thoughts that kind of lead you I don't know about you, but I've struggled with that before in my life because I wasn't wearing the helmet. I wasn't wearing the belt of truth to hold up all the other armor. I let it all slip away and the enemy came in. Well, did God really say? Oh, I think you should be worried about that. I think you should be concerned. That person over there, they don't like you. They're looking at you weird. You can't do this. What do you mean? You're weak. You can't, like, all of those things. When you put on the helmet of salvation and you become that new creature that God already has made you to be, all gone, just like that. It doesn't even have to be a process. You have to be alert. I think we get that confused sometimes. Instantaneously when I am saved, I am made a new creature. But I have to be alert that I don't go back into the old way, into the old me. And that's why these kind of messages, though not as exciting, are important. You know, knockout blows happen generally with your head, which is why some boxers do die because you, they hit the head and they literally, um, I was reading about it earlier, literally disconnects different neuron and pathways in the brain. Like, and it just causes it to cease to function. And so the enemy is going to go for that. That'll be his final punch. He's going to try to wear you down and then he's going to try to get into your mind and see if he can get you to believe his lies. But you don't have to because you're a new creature, because you're an overcomer, because you're wearing the armor of God and you know what God says is true. And the important part about protecting your mind and wearing the helmet of salvation is that your thoughts will eventually become words that shape your future. That's why they're so important. And if if the enemy can get in there and get you to think things long enough, you're gonna start to say them out loud. And when you start to say them out loud, you start to put in to effect 
something that God put into effect a long time ago, which was words create. That's why the Bible says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. And so you have to watch your words. And you do that by putting on the helmet of salvation and keeping it on. And the last piece of armor is the sword of the spirit. It's the funnest one, right? It's sharp and shiny and kind of like, I'm kind of a big deal, <laughs> got my sword, I don't know. I'm like a nerd, I grew up with like all the fantasy stuff, dragons and things of that nature. But, um, so the sword's always the fun one, but the sword rep rec represents your authority. It's your authority, like when you have that, right, you're not just some person just like that's sitting off the side that can't do anything for themselves, you've got a weapon. And it does scare the enemy. And that, that authority comes from the word of God. So we don't just memorize verses like, like when, I don't know about you, when I was in kids class, when I was like itty bitty, I went to Vineyard, uh, like the big vineyard in Columbus, that's where I grew up. And uh, in the kids club, they had like all these different like, like little trinkets that you could get by earning points. So every week you had a memory verse and you would come in and you'd tell the memory verse to a teacher and then they would assign you points and blah, 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 blah. Well, there was this cup I don't know why I picked this of all the things, but me and my friends thought this cup was like the coolest thing. And it was just like this tall. I can, rem I can remember it. It's like so clear in my brain. And it was gray and it had a purple lid and then it had like a silly straw. And I thought, dude, that is the coolest cup I've ever seen. Mind you, I was like seven years old, maybe a little younger, six or seven. And I worked so hard for months. I memorized every verse. And what finally put me over for like two weeks, I worked on memorizing all the books of the Bible. Like I was going in Old Testament all the way through New Testament and I was so proud. I walked in that Saturday night to my teacher and I was like, are you ready? Because I, I know all the books of the Bible. And I thought it was some big stuff, right? So I tell them to her and she's like, wow. I get pulled up to the front of the class. Look at Alicia, wow. So there's getting a lot of excitement here because I'm like, everyone knows I did it. This is great. And they, they're like, what prize do you want? You have enough points. And I got that cup and I was like, yes, I have the cup. I've got the purple silly straw and the lid and it's great. And um, unfortunately, my dad didn't know that it wasn't like dishwasher safe and it got melted at some point. It wasn't like right after I got it, but it was a devastating day uh, to say the least. But anyways, <laughs> we don't just like memorize verses in the Bible for prizes or for uh, to, to make people, you know, think we're so great or to be impressive. We memorize them because they're life. Because you're gonna have a moment when the enemy's coming in and trying to wear you down when that is your, that's your weapon. That's when you say, hey, no, not me. No weapon formed against me is gonna prosper, right? I'm gonna live a long life and I'm gonna glorify God. These are verses in the Bible, right? Pastor, if you were here this past weekend or the weekend before, he said there's over 7,000 promises in the word of God, right? Why are those promises there? Because he knew you'd need them. They're not just there because he thought, oh, this is fun, I'm just gonna throw out these random words. No, he knew you'd need them. And you gotta pull on them sometimes, and that's what you do when, when you start to feel like, hey, I'm not that new creature, when you start to feel that anxiety or that anger or that addiction or whatever it is, fill in. You start using the word. You need a verse in the Bible that you can use. And let me tell you, there's a verse for every single thing that you would come to face with. I promise you that. So you gotta train, right? You gotta put on this armor and then you gotta train. If you're gonna go into a boxing ring, you better train. You better be ready because your opponent's training. So you better be. First Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, this is kind of long, I know, bear with me. It says this, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body, and I make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Why does he say, no, I strike a blow to my body? Why, why is he not talking about an opponent? Because Satan can't touch you. The only thing he can do is try to get you to knock yourself out, which looks pretty silly, by the way. But a lot of Christians, a lot of people do it. We're just out there flailing around until we finally hit ourselves. You have to get yourself 
in line with the word of God. And actually, I, that's wrong. I shouldn't say it like that. You just have to agree with the word of God. And everything else falls into place. Like, I, don't, I can't get myself into alignment with God's word, but I can believe his word and instantly I'm in line with it. It's as simple as that. Is, I, is this true? Great. Then that's how I'm going to live. Really simple stuff. But it feels difficult, right? Training's only beneficial if you do it and repeat it, right? So if I said, I'm going to train this year and I only trained one time, did I fulfill my New Year's resolution? Sure. I trained. Just once, though. <laughs> Just one time. I only did one five-mile run. I only lifted weights one day, but I still trained. No, that doesn't make it beneficial, though. It's when I repeat it when, it, when it's consistent, when I consistently take myself back to Jesus, when I consistently go to his word, when I'm consistently asking him before anybody else of what I should do, when I consistently go to him, that's when it's beneficial. Philippians 4.8 says this, and this is how you train, by the way. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. In a world of social media, of constant interaction with people, yesterday I was selling honey from our farm and I knew that the moment I posted it, I'd have people commenting on it. So my intent was, I'm only gonna post it on Facebook. That's it, because I can keep track of that. Eventually, it's too many distractions, it's too many people, people messaging me, texting me. So I was very clear on my Facebook post. Only comment here. But what I forgot, because I don't use Facebook, I normally am on Instagram, but my Instagram and Facebook are linked. And so what I posted on my Facebook also went to my Instagram. And six hours later, after the honey's all sold out, there are people on there, right? It's distracting. There are so many things that you miss because of all the different ways that we can constantly be reached, where think messages are constantly put in front of our face, where things are repeated to us day and night, where we're meditating on them, even without us recognizing that we're meditating on it. And that's why it's so important to think on what this verse said, to think on things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Take yourself out of some of those places where that's not the case. I promise you, you take a break from social media for even two days, you're gonna see an instant difference in your her thought life, in the health, and in, in your connection with not just God, but the people around you. You're gonna feel more connected. I know we gotta wrap this up, but I wanna encourage you, you gotta train, and there's some areas I think that you should train in. So train in your thoughts, yes. But I mentioned earlier, right, the three things that Jesus didn't deliver you from, persecution, submission, and temptation. With submission, or uh, with persecution, train in love. You know the enemy's gonna throw that at you at some point, somehow, and it may not be like a martyr who goes and, you know, dies for the gospel. But you will face some sort of persecution, Jesus promises it. So what are you gonna do to train so that you're ready and you're alert? You're gonna train in love and forgiveness. Love and forgiveness. If you can train in just those things, wow. And you know how you do that? You do that by spending time with him. That's the only place that we can get, get those things, that love and forgiveness. You only get it from him. And then instead of feeling like, oh, I gotta forgive this person, it just, it's just, it flows out because you received it. So you just are literally just passing through what you already got. When I'm with Jesus, I am loved and I am forgiven. So now it's just a natural extension of who I am to be like, nope, nope, no worries, no big deal, it's fine, we're good. Yeah, I forgive you, I love you, you're amazing. Like, things just roll off your back when you've been spending time with Jesus. Now any kind of persecution or offense or anything like that doesn't matter anymore. Submission. Train in humbleness. And that means it's okay, you don't know it all the time. You don't have to know every Bible verse, you don't have to know every fact, you don't have to understand the ins and outs of all the things, right? Jesus does. You gotta receive coaching. Many, many adults cannot handle it if you walk up to them and say, hey, you're awesome. You know, you could, you could do this better next time if you do this. They get all upset and feel like you're picking on them. It's really just a submission and insecurity issue. Can you receive constructive criticism? What do you do with it? And obedience. You know how you train in that? You listen to your parents, but more importantly, listening is not actually the key to obedience. It's a part 
How quickly do you do what you were told? That is, that's the key. If God told you right now, go pray for that person, would you do it right now or would you sit there all night? You'd kind of hover around the person, but not close enough that they notice and be like, okay, okay, okay. And then they leave and you're like, oh, well, I missed it, God, sorry. They left, I'll get them next week, right? <laughs> I'm not speaking from personal experience at all. Um, obedience, though, obedience and quick obedience, immediate obedience, doing exactly what he said, exactly when he told you to do it. That is training and submission. And if you ask God, he'll train you. He'll give you things to do. He'll ask things of you that are gonna stretch you, that are gonna make you feel uncomfortable. And then temptation, how are you gonna train there? Well, you first have to understand you're not a slave to sin. It doesn't control you. It has no power over you. You don't have to sin, which is a strange thought, right? Like, I don't have to sin? Wait, what? No, you don't have to sin. You are free from it. The Bible says that he freed you from sin and now you can choose. Will I be a slave to sin or will I be a slave to God? Tell you what pays better, being a slave to God. It has no power over you. So you've got to believe that. And and the question is, what do you believe? Do you believe that this thing, people are like, I just can't kick it. Well, that just shows where their belief is, right? They don't believe that they're free. You are free. And it's as simple as that, is believing you're free and then doing something about that freedom. And then last, train with Jesus. Train, train in his presence. Get close to him this year. And it doesn't have to be religious and it doesn't have to be the same time every day. It's just a recognition that he's there, that he's in your life, that he cares about you and he really, really wants you to know him. And he will tell you all about him if you ask him. And it's a really cool thing. You know, this year, I want you guys to experience the good life, and people get a little tripped up about the good life. When they come to faith life, they're like, the good life, was that just stuff? No, it's not just stuff. That can be a part of it. But the good life is walking in the plans that God has for you. It's living life in his kingdom and doing it his way. And the, the fact of the matter is, when I live his way, when I seek his kingdom, this is what the Bible says, seek my kingdom and all these things will be added to you. When I do it his way, when I obey, when I persevere when people pick on me or persevere when I'm tired and I don't wanna do it or whatever the thing might be, like I grow in God and I get closer to him but I also get everything added to me that I thought that I was giving up that I really want but I'm not sure how to get. Like you don't have to fight for things when you live it his way. And so I really want that for you guys this year. I I want you guys to to succeed, not in the world sense of succeed, though that may it may look like that, but I just want to see you thriving. I want to see you happy. I want to see you free because you really are. I want to see you living in the God-ordained calling he has for you. I want to see you take on this world as the overcomers you are and overcome it. That's what I want to see. And I mean, I can see it all day. I see each and every one of you that way, but you have to see it. That's the thing. You have to come to Jesus and let him show that to you. And so my hope is this year that 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 is what you see for yourself and that you can just draw closer to him. But we're gonna wrap it up tonight. I'm just gonna pray over you guys and just kind of this year for a few minutes and then I'll send you out because I know you gotta be hungry at this point, right? Who doesn't want pizza right now? unless you're not eating sugar. Sorry to those who are eating sugar. But (laughs) Father, I thank you so much for these amazing people, for these world changers, God, for these visionaries and uh, all kinds of talents that are in this room. But most importantly, I just thank you for your sons and daughters. I thank you that you are close to them, that your word says that when we draw close to you, you draw close to us. Your word says that you're just waiting on us to turn to you, Father. And so I thank you that this year they turn to you, God, and that they draw close to you in a way that they've never done before. Father, I thank you that you're protecting them, that you don't just, don't just have a plan for their life, but you have a way of protecting it as well and preserving it. Father, I thank you even in the room right now that you would begin to touch hearts and minds that they would come to know you and to know your truth and to understand the vast love that you have for them, God. That nothing they can do will ever change how you feel about them. And that when they come to you, everything that they've ever struggled with, everything they've ever done is separated 
as far as the east is from the west, never to be seen or understood again, God. I thank you that that would just settle in their hearts in such a deep way that this year would be the year that they know that they're loved and that nothing is impossible with you, God. So I thank you for it. I thank you for the rest of this school year that people who felt like, wow, this has been a rough year, God, that this would, t- it would turn, that you would speak to them, that you would bring people around them to encourage them in their schools, that you would give them courage to be the encouragers in their schools. God, I thank you for anything that they are anxious about, Father. Maybe it's moving on to college next year, or maybe it's a family situation or whatever it is. God, I thank you right now, all of that anxiety leaves and your peace that passes all understanding replaces it, God, that they can receive that, Father, and that they can see through your eyes how to walk out the situation, that they would hand it over to you, God. I thank you that this year, um, while it's just a span of time, it does represent a season that they can choose to trust you in, God, that they can choose to submit to you, God, that they can choose to lay it before you and experience your goodness in the land of the living, Father. That it's not something they have to wait till they get to heaven to experience, but they can experience it now. I thank you for it, Jesus. I bless them as their youth pastor. And I thank you for each and every single one of them. In Jesus' name, amen. (laughs)